We are here gathered at a consequential place in a consequential time. Having this conversation because race matters in America. It's one of the principal things that we have a difficult time figuring out how to communicate over. I used to work for President Trump. Oh! And I'm a black Republican. I have questions. I was calling the chief of police and the mayor racist. As a white police widow, I wondered if other people understood what he and we had sacrificed. That othering of everyone else has created a lot of this division where it's either black or white. Life is not black or white. If America isn't conversing in this way, America's not going to heal. And that's exactly what we need to happen. Leon Ford was left paralyzed after he was shot by a Pittsburgh police officer six years ago. I really believe America is at a inflection point. A Forest Acres Police Department officer shot and killed in the line of duty. He leaves behind a young wife and a newborn baby boy. In some ways, we've never felt more divided. But we don't need to agree in order to talk. to lean in to what's uncomfortable. To speak the truth. And what better place than over a meal? OK. So we are, we are here having this conversation um, because Race matters in America, right? And so it's worth talking about it, but it's also worth talking about the conversation over race itself. Because as important as it is, it's one of the principal things that we have a difficult time figuring out how to communicate over. You know, we all lean so hard on stereotypes, generalizations, you know? Stereotypes do a lot of work in America, but they can do a lot of damage, too. But I want to know from you guys, sort of, you know, what are some of the stereotypes that maybe, just maybe, find themselves getting applied to you that perhaps you feel don't, don't adequately or accurately represent who you really are, right? Yeah, uh, I was reflecting on this recently. Um, in the beginning of my activism, I did a lot of work with Democrats. Recently, I've worked with more Republican. Mm. And, um, I never had an allegiance to either party. I didn't grow up in a political household. Most people will probably find themselves in the middle and not, you know, on yeah. the left or the right. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so does that mean that you have the experience of people maybe stereotyping you politically? Oh, uh, absolutely. What do people yeah. assume about you? People assume that, one, I know about politics. Yeah, they they assume that I know. And the reality is, I don't know much about politics, right? Um, even in the, the last election, I found myself just thinking, like, where, where do I fit? Like, it's like, I don't want to vote based on someone persuading me about, you know, personality or whatever, what issues mean the most to me and how would my life be impacted? Now, bef before I was shot and even after I was shot. And we gonna get to that, right? right. We gonna get to that. Cause, um, uh, we got some stories to share around yeah. this table. That's yeah, sure. my, my experience was a little different. It's good to see you. It's good to be here with you. Likewise, friends. It's a very interesting space. Yeah. What brings you here, man? What's your relationship to this? So I was shot five times by a police officer in Pittsburgh. This is 19-year-old Leon Ford, crippled after he was hit four times by gunfire from a police officer. Here's the incident from dash cam inside a Pittsburgh police vehicle. When I was 19 years old, I was uh, pulled over by a few Pittsburgh police officers um, during the traffic stop, and 
Um, unfortunately, they thought I was somebody else after I provided my identification. And uh, ultimately, I would end up being shot five times. Uh, one of the bullets ended up paralyzing me. I mean, it's got to be striking to you because your name could easily be on one of these on one of these markers. I think that's where my gratitude comes from. Mm. Just grateful to be alive. Now, take a look at this video. This is Ward with his four-year-old son as he struggles with his injuries. Doctors say he will never walk again. Yeah, I dealt with a lot of depression, a lot of hatred, uh, contemplating revenge. Andrew, do you get hit with stereotypes? How do they feel? Are they fair? I've been hit with a bunch the last 10, 12 years. When I became a public figure, uh, people assumed um, that I only thought and acted the way older white people of privilege acted. Mm. Mm. And that was, that was really hard for me to not be defensive about. I grew up in, I'm, a, I'm more of a socialist utopian. I was raised in a very political house in New York and an extremely progressive house in New York. You know, we, in the 60s, we had Black Panthers raising money mm. for the cause in my parents' living room. I mean, that's, that's how fervent it was when we experienced a whole series of events here in Minneapolis, people were like, oh my God, I had no idea. I'm like, you had no idea? Where are you living? Protesters have set fire to Minneapolis' third police precinct. We want to give you a look from uh, Sky 4. The significant thing about what's going on here, symbolically, is the third precinct is where the officers who were involved in the George Floyd arrest uh, were headquartered. Wow. Yeah, have you been here before? I have not. It's very powerful. Heartbreaking and powerful. It's different than seeing it on TV or in pictures. I had my heart ripped out when Philando Castile was murdered. And then it just felt like someone was stomping it on the ground. Yeah. It was, it was brutal and then of course, in the subsequent nights, seeing, you know, my town on fire, seeing so many people who I love and respect um, in so much pain. I believe that, you know, our, my city, my state, our nation requires law enforcement. We are a nation of laws, but I think how we do it has to change. I don't know how you feel. You know, I was thinking as I was preparing today. Um, so my story, my husband was a police officer who was killed in line of duty. It will be six years ago this Thursday. And when it happened, um, I'll never forget this moment. Um, the news started rolling out. You know, hearts are broken. Uh, Forest Acres is a small community, small police department, we're one big family. The raw pain of Chief Gene Seeley's voice as he addresses a community today requesting prayers for a police family and a young family at home tonight who will not see a husband, father, and officer killed in the line of duty today. First time holding your baby. Yeah, it's my little boy. When that knock came at the door, I knew. And so the officer who, who told me that he was gone um, has now become one of my dearest friends. And when I think about people like her, and her heart and her love for service and all that she's capable of. And if we can believe in people like Lori to make a difference, yeah. if we can give her that trust and tools and support her drive, what could we be capable of? Like that's how you change real systems from the inside percent. out. So how do you think we can move forward? I don't know how we deal with that other than coming together and talking about it. The only thing that I've ever found that ever works is actually talking yeah. about it after decades of sharing meals, sometimes with people that not only do I not agree with, but have been on the other side of extreme issues. 
I never left that table understanding them less. This is my friend, Ruhel Islam. Uh, thank you very much for the food. You may have, I don't want him to tell it, you may have heard uh, his family's story before. Um, he owns Gandhi Mahal, a restaurant here, the first iteration of which burned to the ground uh, during the riots in late May. Yes. Right? And it has been a tough night, a night of chaos in the city. We have seen industrial buildings, factories, restaurants on fire. Very famously, all around the world, this was the gentleman whose family said, they're burning our restaurant, and he said, let it burn, and stood up for that. Sometimes you have to, uh, tough time come, you have to represent and lead by example. When building burned down, you know, I, I stayed, I said, let my building burn, justice must be served. So when um, building burned down, it's gone, but the community we built it is there. It's there, we'll rebuild again. We turn it to a garden because we're growing food because we believe in tomorrow. I want to underscore something he said. In the ashes of his building, a garden is growing. Yes. And if that isn't a great metaphor for what we need to be doing, I, I don't know what is. Well put, powerfully put. Jerron, tell me, what are the things that, get, that you get tagged with? Um, racially, politically, I mean, what are the assumptions that people make about you? You know, if you know anything about a political background, you might stereotype me to being a, a Uncle Tom. Oh. And I get that why, all the time. Why is that? Um, uh, I used to work for President Trump. Oh, know, a, okay. Yeah, I used to work okay. for President Trump, and, uh, you know, I used to... That um, introduces a certain <coughs> dynamic. Yeah, yeah, and, and mm -hmm. I'm a black Republican. You know, and, and I, I push back on the notion on, on burning buildings down because I, I come from a community that was burned down during the, the riots and never was rebuilt. So that's what led me to being a Republican because I want to proactively go into um, the communities that need to hear it most mm -hmm. and solve for the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I've dedicated my life towards. This is so... Eerie. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how I felt. <laughs> it was so eerie. Especially um across the street here. This looks like some of the communities I've lived in. It makes me think about like his daughter, his family, was left behind. How many of our family has been laid out like that? Uh, how afraid he was in his last moments. Yeah. You know, um, being right here, you know, like in broad daylight, you know, um, with all these people out here. That, Yeah, it's um, it's surreal. It, it's it's surreal, and it does make me think of my own brother. I'm sorry. Cause he was laid out like that at the top of my mother's stairs, and my sibling was trying to bring him back and. They couldn't, and so I have random moments like this. They don't happen as often, but moments where it kind of hits. Yeah. Really sorry about that. Thank you. I think it hurts the most when I think about the unspoken similarities of so many communities of color, right? Which is what motivates me to do my work because I'm a mother of black boys, I'm married to a black man, and there's fear almost every time they leave the house. Uh, I can relate being a black man. Yeah. You know, I, I've only lived in, in those type of communities. Yeah. They all feel like, you know, I'm just disconnected um, from opportunity and, you know, the access to the American dream. And so I've mm -hmm. spent my life trying to create that connection. So at a sacrifice, people call me names, you know, but if, if I'm able to kind of see this whole movement that's been created around historically black colleges or on criminal justice reform or revitalizing neighborhoods and know that I planted a seed 
to to actually move things. You know, it's all worth that sacrifice. Mm. Indeed. I have questions. I appreciate you sharing your story and a little bit about it because I do believe that this mentality that black is a monolith and that there's only one way to be black. And there's so many different ways to be black, white, indigenous, Latinx, right? Like there's so many different ways to be Korean, Japanese. Like it's not a one size fit all approach. Sure. And that's why I said I have questions because I wanted to ask, not necessarily around your identity, but if you had the spectrum of experience, then why does it sound like you're saying there's only one tactic or a certain type of tactic that's acceptable versus others? No, I, I wasn't implying that at all. Um, so if I applied that, that's, that's a misunderstanding. Okay. Um, that, that was my personal walk, mm -hmm. you know, on um, me as an individual. I've spent enough time working with my colleagues on the right to be in a position to kind of bring, bring people who understand conservative values mm -hmm. and want to work with people across the aisle. And so what I, the movement I care about more is moving our country forward. But you know, this construct of race was used to kind of not have us work together, the people on that same yes. economic ground. But it's also been used as a weapon to separate us, the construct. You know, there are a lot of folks, I think, on either side, a lot of folks who position themselves as being broadly on your side politically and broadly Antoinette on your side politically drawn, who would say that, look, y'all are wasting time talking to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, if this brother has voted for Trump, he has canceled himself. But you guys are sitting here having, having this conversation. Is it at all difficult or does it feel like the right thing to be doing to, to be curious and ask these questions? Because you're asking him questions, you're curious about what got him here. Mm -hmm. And that seems powerful to yeah. me. Even in your statement when you said, I don't agree with buildings being burned down, there's a more productive way to go about it. I have seen that as a way of division. I have seen it as a way of judgment, especially when we think about the uprising in Ferguson. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I lived in more underinvested neighborhoods in St. Louis than Ferguson. And when I've been in spaces where there has been activists, organizers, space where there's been political people, corporations, et cetera, there's usually this division where we're pointing at each other and saying, your way is not the most effective way. My way is the more effective way. And that to me has, is, is, is essentially what has perpetuated a lot of the division is because we have this one size fit all mentality versus the reality that we need a variety of interventions to get where we're going. And so yes, for you, for you, it may not make sense to burn down a building and you're right. Some business leaders do not, business owners do not have the financial capital to be able to rebuild. For some folks, they have the mentality of, my, we have not received any investment to begin with. How are you going to put more value on a built structure than someone's life? It's been interesting to me to hear in this conversation and just the broader racial conversation, people quoting Martin Luther King Jr., right? And it's funny because you just see all the nuance go out of it because sometimes people will make the point that, you know, Dr. King was nonviolent. Other people say yes. Dr. King said that riots are the cries of the unheard and so forth. When the truth is he, he spoke to the whole spectrum of that reality. He did. That you have to understand people's pain before you judge them for their violent actions, but we still have to push towards a better way, right? And so what I love about this exchange is the richness of the nuance that's in there. Yeah, and, 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 and the thing is, and because I agree with you, it's, it's really about being heard. What, what, I, what I fear is just that, like, when all the cameras and stuff are gone, you know, mm -hmm. what, what happens with the ashes? What's left over. What's left over. And that's, that's what worries me, because I, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, so um, when, when I was talking about the riots, um, for me, I'm talking about the Huff riots from 68. Oh, so okay. you're talking about yeah, 1992. See, talking, yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you a community like, of my, yes, my, 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 so um, my grandparents and my parents grew up in, has looked the same way since the riots because they burnt down the building. Correct, but you said something so brilliant. I, I feel, uh, it, I feel very connected to you having heard your story. There's so much of it that I believe in. I, 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 you finished speaking, I was ready to run through a brick wall for you. <laughs> and if you had told me two hours ago that I would say that about anyone who worked in the Trump administration, I would have laughed at you. That's impossible, right? It just shows the power of conversation and human understanding. When you tell me your story, I can relate to it. Because the most important thing you said was at the end, you said, I believe in moving forward, forward. I want us to move forward into a place where we are all, and if we hear these things, I mean, you said it so much better than I ever could. Yeah. It, it is about all of us, under, it is about these divergent sets of opinions and that, that othering 
of everyone else has created a lot of this division where it's either, and I'm not making a joke here, it's either black or white. Life exactly. is not black or it's white. Not. It's very yeah, gray. It's, it's very gray. Yeah, what she said is exactly correct. This is, this is correct. Now, you know, we wouldn't be here if the conversation over race in America was a little bit more like that at present. Now, it's, it's a funny thing. We were all earlier at George Floyd Square, which was powerful. I saw a couple of signs there, so many rich quotes littering the landscape. One was a quote from uh, King T'Challa, Black Panther, right? And I'm, I'm not gonna get it quite correct, but it said something along the lines of, in times of trouble, some people build barriers, but the wise build bridges. And you see that spirit coming out and people wanting to heal through the pain and connect with others. But then I saw a bunch of flyers that said something very different. It said, speaking stereotypes, it said, all cops are Derek Chauvin, mm. right? And I looked at that for a second, I was like, man, if that is not a, a striking statement, right? Cassie, if, I think you mentioned your husband, but we really haven't gotten your story yet in detail. Can you tell us about, you know, your path here? So, I'm a police widow. Um, on September 30th of 2015, my husband, Greg, was killed in the line of duty. For context, since this conversation is around race, um, it was a black man who was out in front of the mall, and the first officer to show up um, was also black, and my husband was white. And he showed up, um, and the man had a gun and shot him in the head, and he died instantly. And you know, I'm very thankful that out of all the feelings I felt since losing my husband, hate and anger have been among the least common. I felt really deeply called to try to find a way to bring people together, um, but I wasn't quite sure what that looked like. Over time, I came to see that if I really wanted to be a part of bringing about real change, I had to more deeply understand why people so significantly distrust police. I spent a lot more time listening and a lot less, less, um, lot less time talking. And it was there that I realized that we have so much more in common than we do different. And if we could connect with one another, if we could get to know each other, build trust relationships that enable us to work together to take action, we can achieve this shared vision where our communities be safe, our families be protected, and our children to thrive. And that's... Um, if I could jump in, I just want to just acknowledge your strength. Um, I know what it feels like to lose someone and how you may feel close to that date. Right? My sister was killed September 30th, 2006. Yeah, she was hit. Same date? The same exact date. And that reminds me of, like, a lot of times when we think about the activists burning things down or, you know, marching or however, you know, I always encourage, you know, people to just embrace their feelings. It's easy to criticize actions. Right, but when you go into those spaces and you when you say, yo, you have a right to feel the way that you feel, sit with it. You don't have to necessarily take action yet. Like after I was shot, one, I had a very supporting family, right? Um, and then two, I was able to find purpose from my pain, you know? And unfortunately, a lot of young black men and women in this country have been stripped of that purpose. They've been stripped of their dignity. And the only thing that they have is to burn something down, right? And so I had similar anger and hatred, you know, in my heart. And what I realized is that a lot of people in the country uh, are severely traumatized. I work with police officers now. Right, and they are severely traumatized. Activists are se severely traumatized. When you're severely traumatized, it's very hard to be objective. But you know what's the funny thing about that coming from you, specifically, Leon, is the fact that out of not just everybody at this table, um, but just about anybody I know, nearly, I think that nobody would blame you if you decided to sit here and say what that poster said, that all cops are Derek Chauvin, and yet, it seems like you don't want to say that, right? It seems like you're. I don't you're have time to say that. Way. I don't okay. have time to say that because okay. I have an eight year old son, right? I know one day that my eight year old son is gonna be driving, right? He's gonna be 16 year old driving. If I say that all cops are Derek Chauvin, if I say the police, what? I'm not gonna go out there and shoot a police officer. 
So how is that doing my family any justice? What is that doing? I can go on social media all day and, and you know, create the, a division. However, what I'm doing is I'm not only, you know, preparing my son for the world, I'm preparing the world for my son, mm. right? That means I'm friends with the chief of police in Pittsburgh. I'm friends with the commanders, right? I have lunch with some police officers. Sometimes my son comes to lunch with me. So I'm creating a world that I want my son to live in. Leon, I love so much what your, your story is so powerful and it resonates how you're describing the love for your son is so, reminds me, my son will never meet his dad. Nothing can change the fact that he was taken from him. But I don't want my son to live in fear. And someone made a bad choice, but that doesn't mean people are bad. It's interesting because during the George Floyd protests, Pittsburgh was like going up. They were protesting and I was on Twitter. I'm tweeting away. I was calling the chief of police and the mayor racist and saying they didn't care about black people and all types of stuff. But then a couple weeks later... You were? Yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> and a couple weeks later, I just had this moment where I said to myself, how about I help them become better leaders instead of mm. criticizing them? Beautiful. Amen. And I met but How can them. we lead in that space? But I not everyone so wants important. to do that work. You yeah. mean the receivers? Yes, and also the, the givers. Oh, I think, okay, because I, there's, there's a problem. Right. Because you have two different problems there. Right. Yes. Because, and I think... When I, I'm right now, I'm gonna talk, yeah, I'm going to talk through the lens of the giver. Like, mm -hmm. I made a conscious choice years ago to be okay with educating. But I also want to name that being in a position of education means that I am constantly taking on a lot of emotional labor mm -hmm. to help someone else grow. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. So I do believe it's okay for people to make the choice if they want to be in that role or not. Like, it sounds mm -hmm. like to me, all of us at this table have said, I am okay with making that choice. Yeah. But I don't then look at the folks that said, I don't want to educate and say, well, you're not doing what you should be doing. And it, there's a, also you know? a position of privilege, yes. right? Mm -hmm. I sit in a position of privilege where, you know, um, I have, you know, local, national, international resources to really solve problems, right? Yeah, well, I, I think that the privilege piece is key, of course, because part of what you're saying is that you've got the space and the wherewithal to act on that empathy, right? Cassie, you had a right to be angry. Leon, you had the right to be angry, right? We have a right to stay rooted in the things that we don't like about this world. Who could blame us when we suffer and when we lose for remaining in that position? But if we do, do we not rob ourselves of both the opportunity to make the world better for other people, but also even for ourselves? Hate and resentment are toxic, right? Trauma is toxic. Shame is toxic. There's, there's a couple others, right? I was an addict, and I was an alcoholic, and now I'm not, you know? Uh, the week before I sobered up, I tried to kill myself, you know? With lots of details in there. It's a horrible place to be that hopeless, to feel that alone, to feel like there's no point in going on, and then to have your life shift around in a short number of years where you have every bit of hope. I said to, to Cassie earlier today, I'm not a glass half full or a half empty person. I believe the glass is refillable. The bedevilment, the puzzlement for me is that how do we reach that man that shot mm -hmm. your husband? How do we reach that cop that thought it was okay to discharge his firearm five times at someone in a car? How do we reach even the Derek Chauvin's of the world, right? Right, how do we reach the disenfranchised, but also how do we reach each other, right? Antoinette, you're able to sit here and break bread with Brother Jerron, mm -hmm. but can America do that? Mm -hmm. The two of you are here, you know, just to take y'all as an example, because I think your politics start in different places, but as Andrew was saying earlier, I mean, I think we would run through brick walls for each other because we see this deeper thing that animates us, this deeper motivation. Can America get there? And um, what does that road look like for you? Yeah, there's a, there's a few things coming up for me. Mm -hmm. um, what I heard uh, Leon and Andrew talking a little bit about their backgrounds, I also heard them say that they were actively working to build their humility. Mm -hmm. Because I personally believe that you first have to build your humility to ultimately become empathetic. 
you can't yeah. really pursue empathy that, that's real. if you haven't unpacked your own biases, your own unseen areas, your own identities that are important to you, your values, your feelings, right? I think also we need to intentionally create spaces of belonging and inclusion, um, and also recognize the power of the narratives that people hold, the living expertise that they hold, and that those narratives also belong, and they are inclu included, and not just viewing one narrative at a time. I keep thinking about this, this issue of trauma in our country. It's literally trauma-filled neighborhoods. And that's happening in black, white America all across the country. And uh, hurt people hurt people. It's why we can't politicize these issues. And, you know, I've worked in politics my last 17 years of my life, and it, and it hurts me that everything's so politicized because uh, America needs people to help bring us together more than ever. There's work to be done and work to be done together, and it's beautifully said. I think what I want to do to close out is just give folks listening, sort of, you know, each of us, just one concrete tactic or piece of advice in terms of how we can go forward and have these conversations in our own lives. So I'm going to start with you, Andrew. What is one thing you would tell people? If you're not contributing actively, positively towards a solution, um, then sadly you're part of the problem. You can't think your way into right acting but we can act our way into right thinking. You have to have these conversations at the dinner table yeah. with your kids and with your friends. I bring up these subjects when I'm at dinner parties and people look at me like I've done something wrong. And I'm like, <laughs> what are we gonna do? Talk about news, weather, and sports? We are at a, a dramatic hinge event crossroads in the history of our great republic. And the, the, the our, our democracy is on the line here. If we are not changing for the positive, um, we are becoming part of the problem. It's the little stuff, chop wood, carry water. Get out there every day in your own community, grow where you're planted, and, and make a difference in your own community. Well, if well, you people know, you, do that all around the United States, we're, we're gonna be a lot better off. Well, you put it succinctly and spectacularly, I thought you can't think your way into right acting, but you can act your way into right thinking. That every was powerfully time. said. Jerron, one quick piece of advice for folks at home. Don't stay in the bubble. Don't, Don't stay in your bubble. own personal bubble. We all have a responsibility. It's kind of an American commitment, you know, to be a part of the change we want to see in America. You only can do that by stretching yourself and getting to know people outside of your bubble. Mm, get out your bubble, folks. Well said. Cassie, what would you tell people? One I, thing. I really would agree with Jerome. I, lean into meeting someone new, into mm. different experiences, go to a different neighborhood, connect, have mm. some different conversations, and have the courage to have hope. Have the courage to have hope. That's powerful. Antoinette. So I'm gonna challenge you a little bit, but I'm gonna be very quick. Mm -hmm. uh, one around uh, getting out of the bubble. I also wanna add to that and dismantle ivory towers. Don't live in them. Your computer also can be an yeah. ivory tower. Mm -hmm. How do we move beyond that? Mm -hmm. But that means that we also have to do internal work for ourselves, which could include, in addition to reflecting on your identity, actually consuming content that has different identities than your own. And we need to really expand our understanding of other people's culture and their other experiences. Amen. Leon, take us home. Yeah, I recognize that the trajectory of my life changed significantly when I became uh, more intentional about healing. Mm. And so I would say focus on healing from the inside out. Mm. So before we can go out and try to change the world, let's focus on the inside and uh, really evolve spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and psychologically. Mm, beautiful. Folks, this has been a wonderful conversation. And the conversation continues, right? And it needs to. So I'm honored to be here. This has been beautiful. We need to break bread again. I'm happy to do this with y'all anytime. And um, let's make that garden grow. Amen. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right now we can just create the spaces to lean in, to listen to one another, to be open. That we are able to break our echoing chambers. And collaborate for a greater good. Meet this you. is my sister over here, man. I know, right? <laughs> I think that's the best way to move things forward. Brother, oh man. That's what it takes to get democracy working again. So there's no limit, really, to the good that can come from this. Get in there! If we get this culture of discussion going again in the right direction. And that is precisely what we have to do.